Welcome to the National Board of Forensic Evaluators uh, webinar entitled Filicide, Does Hidden Hostility at Home Lead to Murder? with Dwight Bain, Licensed Mental Health Counselor and National Certified Counselor of the LifeWorks Group. My name is Aaron Norton and I'm the Executive Director of MBFE and I'll also be moderating today's webinar. This webinar is a service that MBFE provides to all of our members, as well as members of our partnering organizations, such as the American Mental Health Counselors Association and several state and local professional associations. For those of you who aren't familiar with MBFE, we're a national not-for-profit organization officially endorsed by the American Mental Health Counselors Association that provides quality training and certification in the specialty area of forensic mental health evaluation for licensed mental health professionals. We maintain three specialty credentials, including Certified Forensic Mental Health Evaluator, Certified Child Custody Evaluator, and Certified Forensic Behavioral Analyst. We also advocate for all appropriately trained licensed mental health professionals to be able to administer and interpret psychological tests. For more information on NBFE, you can visit us at nbfe.net. Housekeeping items out of the way. First, we'll cover how you ask questions. All of our attendees are automatically muted, so no one's going to be able to hear you or see you during the webinar. If you want to ask a question, just click on the triangle symbol next to questions on your GoToWebinar control panel. That will expand the questions panel and give you space to type in a question. I'll be collecting those questions throughout the webinar, and then I will ask them on your behalf when the presenter is ready for them. If your question is particularly complex, I might ask you if you'd like to be unmuted at which time you can verbally ask the question directly to the presenter through your microphone. At the end of today's webinar, you'll see a post-webinar evaluation form populate on your screen. Please complete it because it'll be helpful for us, but it'll be critical if you want CEs. If you'd like a CE certificate, you need to make sure you complete that evaluation form today. And if you miss it, you'll get a follow-up email one hour after today's webinar with a link that'll enable you to, com enable you to complete that uh, survey as well. Now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, we also are, are going to be posting a recording of today's webinar and providing that to you in case you'd like to review some of the information. And uh, we're going to have a handout available for you as well. It's not yet in the control panel, but we'll have it up during the uh, webinar today. Now we're gonna launch just a couple quick polling questions to kind of see who's out there in the audience today. The first polling question should be on your screen right now. Which of the following describes your professional identity? And you can select more than one option if it applies. Your options are clinical mental health counselor, clinical social worker, clinical or counseling psychologist, marriage and family therapist, or psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner. Wow, so everybody on the webinar is a clinical mental health counselor, but also 14% of you are clinical social workers and 14% are marriage and family therapists. So I think we have some people who are duly licensed who are on the webinar today. Our second and final polling question is, which of the following organizations are you a member of? Your options are American Mental Health Counselors Association, American Psychological Association, American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, National Association of Social Workers, or none of the above. 57% of you are not a member of any association, 29% are OMCA members, and 14% are APA members. All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's presenter. Dwight Bain is a licensed mental health counselor and a national certified counselor in practice since 1984 with a specialty in managing crisis events. He's a certified instructor for critical incident stress debriefing, and he served on a critical incident team after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 in New York City at Ground Zero. Bain is a trusted media resource on trauma recovery, who's been interviewed on over 500 radio and television stations in the US, as well as quoted in over 100 media sites. And on a personal note, I'd like to add that um, I have always experienced Dwight Bain as a very genuine and compassionate individual, and somebody is very knowledgeable and we're very fortunate to have him being able to provide us with training. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dwight Bain. All right, so Dwight, we cannot hear you right now. <laughs> All right, there we go, good. now you're on. There it is. So you should be able to both see and hear and I'm very thankful that we can spend some time together there we go. I'm in Dallas, Texas, and very excited. Uh, I borrowed an office, Aaron, so that I could spend some time on this very important subject. 
because filicide we know sadly is one of the fastest growing forms of violence against families and in our training time Aaron is going to load up a, a very extensive study guide it's going to give you the tools that you need as we go forward and I'll also say this at the end of the study guide because on some of the my teaching slides it has fill in the blanks but at the end of the study guide it has the answer key in fact the study guide already has the fill in the blanks filled in so that way you'll have the tool the resources the information because I want you to know exactly what to look for when you're working with families. I believe that filicide is a form of hostility, a form of domestic violence that is often overlooked. So let's dive into the training material right now. And we start with, oh, turn the camera off. All right. Well, there it is. So you can see, let me move that out of the way. Oh, all right, I'm just gonna talk through it because for some reason that little bar is up. So as we take a look at this, let me give you some bullet points because fill aside gets beyond the question of how close you are to your family to imagine killing family. And you'll see on the screen is a picture of a police officer uh, outside of Tampa Bay, Florida who killed his wife, he killed his daughter, and he killed his granddaughter. One of the most shocking things that happened because you say, how in the world did all of these things take place? Well, hidden hostility at home. And when we look into some of the news stories around the country, oh, you can see my screen. Some of the news stories around the country, the Watts family, the dad killed the children, killed his wife, and you say, well, is it just dads? No, Sarah and Jennifer Hart killed their children, drove off a cliff with all of those children. And you say, what in the world is happening? You go into the Midwest, a grandfather killed his son, his daughter-in-law, and all of the children. And you think, what is going on? Is it crazy? Well, it's a form of mental illness, but I want you to understand that it's also more common than you could possibly imagine. As we go through our training time, uh, as Aaron said, you're able to ask questions. And as we're going through, all you have to do is bring up the little text box. You can see the text box. So, uh, and Aaron says that I can send you the PowerPoint. I think I'll do that because that screen coming up is a little distracting to me. It's probably distracting to you as well. So, over to my camera for a minute. So you'll see. Uh, me as I talk you through this, because I'm just going to give you some statistics in the beginning. You'll see that on your study guide. There it is. The FBI says that between 450 and 500 children are murdered by their by their parents. That's almost 100 kids. Now that's the ones that are known. So we take a look at this. One in three victims were babies under the age of 12 months of age. A mother kills her child somewhere in the United States about every three days. Every three days, a mom kills her own child. Uh, sons uh, were more likely to be killed than daughters. Sons were killed 52% of the time, and again, more likely to be killed by their mom. Parents used what the FBI study called personal weapons to either beat, choke, or drown victims. In the majority of cases, it involved underage kids. Right now, you may be thinking, this is just really disturbing, and it is, and you'll see on the screen, kind of don't worry about that for a minute. I'm gonna send Aaron the PowerPoint slide deck so that uh, we can see it without the, the information that popped up on the side. And I want you to be able to have access to everything. It's disturbing because it's a type of child abuse. And if the victims were children, it goes in one direction. But I also want you to know sometimes the victims were adults. In fact, victims, uh, the adult victims, uh, parents use guns in, guns in 72% 70, of the killing. 72% of the killings of your own child, who's an adult, was used, uh, involved a handgun. More than 13% of the victims were adults uh, from 18 to 40 years of age. Filicide seems to go down when someone is uh, above the age of 40. But when a young person moves out, an 18 year old moves out, it absolutely does not mean that they're free from violence from their, uh, parents or violence from their extended family, 18 to age 40. As you take a look at this, 
when, when we move forward. The first principle is the Great Depression. We saw suicide rates jump exponentially. Suicide went up in the Great Depression. However, here's what's really interesting. In the Great Recession, that's where we saw filicide go up. And the filicide that went up was uh, related to, for some people, finances. They lost everything. They lost their money. They lost their house. And so instead of filing bankruptcy, I know this sounds really disturbing and really uh, troubling. It certainly is to me. They killed their family. Can you imagine? About 30 minutes from our office in Orlando, there was a filicide in one of the most exclusive country clubs in Central Florida. And the dad who had lost his job was losing the home, killed his wife, killed their children, in fact, killed uh, the entire family. And the odd thing is, killed the family in their own beds. There are case after case after case, but today I'm in Dallas, Texas. And Andrea Yates, in 2001, you'll see each of those boys, she, she drowned each one in the bathtub. And you go, this is truly disturbing. It is. But when you start to track filicide cases, some of the most disturbing cases are actually in Florida. On June the 11th, almost the one-year anniversary of the uh, Pulse shooting, or the two-year anniversary of the Pulse shooting, a 35-year-old father who was a felon on probation for arson battered the mom, killed her, or actually battered her, and then she escaped. He killed the children, his own children, ages 1, 6, 10, 11. And then he shot an Orlando police officer who's still in a life or death situation. There was a 24-hour hostage standoff. Five were killed. One was injured. And when you start to look at some of these statistics, it's disturbing. Almost 72% of filicide victims were age six or younger, right? Moms and dads kill their children. 90% of filicide victims, 90% were, the own, were their own biological children. Now that's significant to me because you might think, well, homicide happens and suicide happens in blended families. Filicide's probably blended families. Nope. It actually, the majority of the time, it was their own children. Now, as we're going along, there'll be a point where Aaron will have the slide deck and, um, and he'll so just So Dwight, I have, uh, I have just projected the slides onto the screen. So hopefully everybody can now see them in full presentation mode. Oh, wonderful. Look at that. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. Okay. And then in, in presentation mode, just a technical point, please don't adjust your set. Now I can move it over a little, uh, the text box screen, the help screen was moved over. Good. All right. So we're moving beyond slides. Uh, do I move these slides, Aaron? Are you moving the slides? No, I'll have to move them on my end. So Got uh, okay. do you want me to just, just keep see. cycling? Yeah. yeah, just keep cycling through. Uh, and I'll do the same thing on my end. You'll see a pie graph. You'll see 90%. You'll see one every, uh, once every three days. Okay, sons, daughters. And then there's a slide that says parents used personal weapons, beat, choke, drown, right? 72%. One third of the victims are just babies. That's troubling. Now let's look at the reasons for killing. Uh, and in fact, this will be in your study guide. Altruism is because the parent says, you know what? Your dad's going to get custody of you. Your dad's a crazy person, so I'm going to kill you. Acute psychosis, obviously we would expect that. Unwanted child. Sometimes that happens. They kill the child because they think the child is a hindrance. An accidental death, spousal revenge. And uh, we'll see more of that in a moment as we as we go through the psychiatric history, social isolation, unemployed, uh, personal history of abuse. Uh, you'll see that on the slide, Aaron, if you go uh, two more slides, slide number 19 in the deck. Unmarried, indigent. And one of the least categories was limited education. Isn't that incredible? These are educated people, many times who have had very good homes. And then there's a situation where now all of a sudden they're losing, and even though they're educated, they have access to mental health services, 
they end up killing their own children. So let me give you some of the key takeaways and some of the key bullet points. Filicide is defined clinically as a multiple victim homicide in which the killer's spouse, former spouse, or domestic partner, and one or more children are killed. That is from the clinical study by Wilson Daly and Danielle. When I start to look at this, filicide, even though it's on the increase, is a rare crime. It's only 2.5% of homicides a year, but that's growing between a half a percent to a full percent. When I start to look at, at some profile factors uh, with filicide, uh, and I'm gonna move ahead to the profile uh, piece. On your study guide, if you're tracking along with your study guide with the bottom of page five, because the profile of the recession era family annihilator is a white middle-aged man who's a family breadwinner on the verge of catastrophic financial loss. He's perceived as a devoted parent, a devoted spouse. I want you to understand, as we started to piece together all of the different dynamics, we saw in the profile, many of these people are religious. They live in nice neighborhoods. They're employed. They're educated. And it, it's just shocking because you very likely have seen people that meet this profile. Now, you may be uncomfortable with the term profile. and I know some people are. But when I look at patterns, that's what I want you to see. There are patterns. And just because they look like they're educated or religious or they have a nice home doesn't mean that the children are not at risk. When I'm looking through the patterns and I'm studying this, I want you to understand that stress can lead to these type of crimes. And there are a number of different factors. Uh, there's a slide, it's slide number 28 in the slide deck that looks at crime factors. Let me give you some of the motivations because you will not likely recognize the filicide pattern if you look at the external. Because you'll see a mom or a dad, frequently, not always, who are educated, as I said, nice home. You would not think of them as a risk to their children or a risk to the life of their partner. But there's some factors. Motive is one, right? We look at a motive, we look at a method, which is a weapon, and we look at opportunity. When I think about uh, a weapon, uh, the majority of the time for adults, as I said, that's a firearm, but filicide almost always takes place in a child's own bedroom. It involves strangling, and many of the neighborhoods are middle class to upper class suburban homes. Now, these are disturbing crimes, but when we're looking underneath the surface, we're looking for the motive, we're looking for the method, the opportunity. When, when all three of those line up, it's the very it's the most dangerous. When those three line up, you say, well, okay, what's the motive? Could be revenge, it could be they're afraid of poverty. The weapon, there are, there's access to a lot of weapons. Opportunity, and this is where you and I can come in as mental health professionals, because there's opportunity. Instead of feeling hopeless, we want them to be hopeful. And to be hopeful is to show them a way out of the darkness, to be able to show them that you don't have to end up hurting your family. You can move forward and you can find a way out of the, um, the darkness. You can find a way out of the financial pressure. You can find a way out of all of those problems. As we, as we keep going through, I want to go back to something that I mentioned earlier. It was on one of the slides, but altruism, remember, is I'm doing the child a favor. If you can get into the thinking of that mom, get into the thinking of that dad, when they're thinking, well, the mom doesn't deserve this child. Okay, I want them talking through the pressure. I want them talking through the problems because I don't want them acting out. I think if you talk through it, you can get through it. And talking through it means I wanna especially help people to talk about their stress. I want them to talk about things like disappointment, and distance, detachment. I want, to, I want to get them talking about their stress so they can see a way out of the stress and the pressure and the problems instead of having to act out of the pressure and problems. The stress sometimes, and this is what you're looking for as a mental health professional, 
This is slide 32 in the deck. Hidden stress comes from unexpected life change. Unexpected life change. Life change would be they lost a job. In my experience working with Philicide, this is number one. So when you're counseling that family, you're asking, has anybody lost a job recently? Have they had to move out of their home? Especially if, if they're talking about they had a nice home, they had a beautiful home, and now they've lost it. Have they had to move out of their home? That's a marker. That's an unexpected change. Unexpected illness, that's a marker for filicide. Somebody has a serious long-term health problem. Maybe they've gone through a major change, a failure. Maybe they were fired from a job or they've had an accident, a relationship problem. Financial problems, as I said, is very consistent with these middle to upper class families. Maybe they've gone through a recent death, particularly the death of an aging parent. And it will not surprise you that many times it goes back to the whole element of shame. Now, let me give you something called big T trauma and little t trauma. Now, here's what I mean. Because a big T trauma is something that you would expect. A big T trauma is anything that is outside the realm of human experience. This is slide 36 in the slide deck. This is a big one, uh, like a, a major car accident or maybe they were in a bank when there was a bank robbery. But a little t trauma, a little t trauma would be they were fired from a job, their best friend moved away to Canada, they've gone through maybe some, some health problems, but it wasn't life or death. So big t trauma or little t trauma both build up into slide 37 on the deck, a wall of numbness. Every trauma creates a wall of numbness, right? This is chronic stress. And continual and chronic stress comes from a lack of supports, sudden unexpected life events, could be a crisis, or it could just be uh, something that maybe wasn't a major crisis, but it just kept creating more pressure. An example would be a family member that doesn't talk to them anymore. Maybe they're estranged from their parents or estranged from their siblings. These are questions that would come up in a typical psychosocial and mental health evaluation. And then we're paying attention to the degree of relationship connection to other people involved. If something happens on the other side of the country, it's a distant relative, it might not impact them as much. But I was working with a family, we were able to stop self-destructive behavior because they were talking about family that had lost homes and really lost everything in Puerto Rico after the hurricane, Hurricane Maria. And they were starting to feel hopeless and helpless and self-destructive. You're paying attention to these chronic stress indicators. And there are variables of difficulty for families. That's slide 39 in the deck. Anything that affects children, you're gonna read that trauma twice. You're gonna say, wow, this happened to the child. Maybe the child was bullied at school, harassed at school. Maybe they had a child commit suicide or threaten suicide. There's more pressure on the family. Anything that involves human responsibility. And that could be, you know, obviously something as big as as terrorism, but for many people at work, it's called the queen bee syndrome. They get harassed at work. I mean, adults. Remember, filicide is family that kills other family. Almost always it's a parent. There are occasions where a teenager will act out, but almost always this is a biological mom or dad. And when I look at the variables, if there's no warning, massive casualties, the more variables you have, it elevates the trauma. In fact, if you look on slide 40, all of those pressures, all of the stress, all of that change will either lead to catastrophize, that's worry, or normalizing is what we want to do as mental health professionals. To normalize is to say, let's face all of those changes. Let's face these pressures. Let's face these problems. I want to move them past frustration and worry and anxiety. And obviously the big one is anger because I wanna move them past all of that internalized pressure, the fear, the panic, the phobias. The more they internalize it, just like a balloon that gets bigger, 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 it builds up and then it blows up. And when it blows up, tragically, it leads to self-destructive behavior or other destructive behavior, or in this situation, it frequently leads to the occurrence of filicide. All right, as we keep going, this is on uh, slide 41 in the deck. When somebody's going through all of these areas of stress and trauma, it's normal to feel anger, frustration. It's normal to feel shame if you're losing your home. 
you know, we live in a culture in North America where if you lose a home, that's seen as a major sign of failure. And yet there's a guy named Dave Ramsey who's become a multimillionaire now because he spends his whole life, his whole career after going through foreclosure, bankruptcy, and going through uh, losing his home, uh, the repossession of their automobiles from their driveway. And Dave has a radio show on over 600 radio stations talking about how to manage your money because he went through the tough time. And remember, some people showed him a way out. Instead of it all being about self-destructive behavior or shame or failure, Dave turned it around. That's resilience. That's post-traumatic growth. And he turned it around to be able to now help other people not go through bankruptcy, foreclosure, repossession. And he simply talks about staying out of debt, right? It's normal to feel overwhelmed in a high stress situation. And that's where we can come along as mental health professionals to give people hope and to give people encouragement. Now, when I look at, are there gonna be more crisis events? Is there gonna be more filicide? I think in part, the sad answer is yes, because life is harder than it used to be and life is gonna to get tougher. On slide 42, things tend to get worse before they get better. And you know that as a mental health professional, when people are going through really difficult times, Things get sometimes worse as we start to peel back the layers, but then it will get better. Tremendous stress creates one of two paths. It creates tremendous stress or tremendous strength. Tremendous change, that is, creates tremendous stress or tremendous strength. You can actually get better in a very difficult time. Viktor Frankl in the Nazi death camp got stronger. He got better. And you say, how does that happen? How's that possible? He was able, even in a death camp, he was able to look at and change his perspective. As mental health professionals, you and I have a chance to do that as well. We're hearing about all of these pressures, all of these difficulties. We want to guide that individual toward greater strength, resilience, post-traumatic growth. But I want you listening to the major areas of stress, change, loss, grief, trauma. You're listening to all of those changes because it gives you indicators. Is this person going to become self-destructive? I'm going to take a look at this. Uh, one of the areas, you'll see it, it's the next slide, is to look at the secrets, right? So there's a list. If you have a study guide, let's look at them together. On one side of the page, I want you to look at the difference. Public life, the person may appear gentle, calm, safe. They have a realistic lifestyle, maybe even a very wealthy lifestyle. They may appear very devoted to their family, devoted to their religion. They may appear up here confident, well-connected. I mean, they're a great mom. They're a great dad. They may appear secure. Actually, now the key word here is they might appear secure. I learned a long time ago at a food bank where my family was volunteering and Mercedes would pull in, Cadillacs would pull in, and these high profile cars. And I asked the man that ran the food bank, you know, is this right for these really wealthy people to get groceries? This was a long time ago. And he said, Dwight, just because somebody has a fancy car, there might be three payments behind on that car. Just because they have a fancy car does not mean that they are going to be able to make the payment. Sometimes it means that they need the groceries the most and they're judged the most and they feel the most shame. That's why with filicide, a shocking amount of the time, it's middle class, to upper class families where these type of crimes occur against children and against domestic partners. And I look at secrets, right? So one side, we'll call this image management. Everything looks really good. Look at the other side. The private life is their home life. There might be rage, passive aggressive, out of control, just a tornado of emotions. Things are very scary. They're paying attention to their image. And even in counseling, and this is shocking, even in counseling, they will lie to you and tell you everything's fine. Yep, I lost my job. But that's where you, as the mental health professional, I want you to kind of lean into the conversation and say, you know, I remember you lost your job. How are you all doing? You know, we're, we're mental health professionals. We can ask questions about money. It's funny to me sometimes that, and when I say funny, I mean not ha-ha funny, but ironic funny, that uh, a person will talk about sexual issues, orgasm, masturbation. They'll talk very openly about issues of the past, uh, violations in the past, perhaps. It's just a normal part of the conversation, but some counselors get really weird asking about money. Well, that's kind of personal. That's why they're coming to see you. 
that's where they're coming to see you because they're facing some challenges and you're allowed to ask, how are you doing with your money? And they say, doc, you're gonna get paid. You can say, that's not what I'm asking. Are you able to pay your bills? Are you able to keep up? Are there creditors calling the house? There's a man in Tampa Bay who sued the Bank of America because the robocalls, the automatic calls were harassing him sometimes as many as 700 phone calls a day. Literally just continually these robocalls. Here was the problem. He wasn't behind on his payment. He sued the bank for harassment, one, because the, the robotic uh, collection calls were harassing. Well, that was an error and Bank of America was held accountable. But you know, sometimes if someone is truly behind on their bills, they're afraid to pick up the phone and the pressure's building. And the pressure builds and builds and builds. Remember, build up, blow up. But for some people, that blow up includes violent behavior. When I'm looking at secrets, let's look at the next point on the study guide. Dangerous, creepy, isolated. They don't really have friends. They have massive debts. Often the debts are hidden from their spouse. And that's where you can, uh, if you hear about um, collection phone calls. You know, do a lot of people call your house? Are there, is there mail that comes with a little green tag on it, certified mail? Are people coming to the door, knocking on the door? Are there signs on the door that say foreclosure or, or eviction notice? Talking about these very embarrassing areas of finance can be a way to help someone de-escalate the pressure. As I take a look at this, um, uh, they're closed, they're moody. That's an indicator to pay attention to. And they might be very controlling. When we look at point number four on the slide deck, pay attention to success and failure. And success and failure, it's um, the next one in the deck, Aaron. There it is. Pay attention to success, right? Because when we look at success in culture, success is defined as I've got my life together. But the reason they're coming to you, the reason they're coming to me or Aaron, the reason they're coming is because there's something that's missing. There's a gap. And that's not a bad thing. What we want to be able to do is to talk to them that sometimes the greatest failure can be the greatest teacher. When Steve Jobs was fired from Apple Computer, the company that he co-founded, he spent a couple of years away and the most amazing thing happened. He came back, an incredible inventor, and Apple Computer turned everything around. So when I take a look at the next point, I want you paying attention to some depression factors. Here we go. With depression, we're paying attention to environmental factors, biological factors, and genetic factors. And remember, the answer key is right at the end of your study guide. And I put a lot more in the study guide than I knew we could cover because I knew there was a lot to this. And I wanted to give you a tool. It's right here. And it goes on, goodness, um, 17 pages, right? So I knew there'd be more in the study guide than we could cover in the webinar. But this is a tool. You're welcome to keep it, use it, because I want you paying attention. And if, if you think, Dwight, can I share this with people at my office? Absolutely. I wrote it because I believe in adding more value. To give you tools and resources so that you can go and help people that I'll never meet. People all over the country are facing this challenge. And when you know the clues, you can spot it. But let me give you something that's not in the study guide. You will always miss what you're not trained to see. Let me say that again, because I want you to get it. You will always miss what you're not trained to see. Let me give you an example. There's a television show my wife loves, and it's called Antique Road Show, and it's on uh, the, uh, PBS, the Public Broadcasting System. And it shows these people, and they'll have like this, this, you know, I'll, I'll pretend that this is a valuable old thing. And they'll have someone come, and they'll say, oh, how much is it worth? And it'll always be worth, you know, like a million dollars or whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll watch that and think, that's pretty cool. And I'll tell my wife, we've got valuable things in the garage. And she'll say, we've got junk in the garage. You see, if you know what you're looking for, you can spot value. And if you know what you're looking for, you can spot environmental depression, biological depression, genetic factors. In fact, let's go to the next piece. Because if you know what you're looking for, you'll spot depression. If you don't know what you're looking for, you'll miss it. And this is, filicide's almost always missed. Now, the fifth principle I want you to see is the stage of life. The stage of life. Without responsibility, people can never reach their potential. And there are predictable stages of life. Predictable stages of life that measure 
responsibility because responsibility comes in direct proportion to maturity, right? The answer key is at the end of the study guide. But when I look at stages of life, are they in midlife? Are they in menopause? Are they at a place in life where there's maybe some hormonal changes taking place? It's interesting when we start to look at the patterns of filicide, many of these people are in the middle years of life, 35 to age 55, 35 to 55. And so when I see, is this person aging with responsibility, aging with maturity, or is this individual in the type of situation where they're more deeply affected by aging and the stage of life? So we keep moving forward. Let's look at the next principle, All right? Once we move beyond the stage of life and the stages of maturity, there it is. I want you to look at the issues of the soul. And we're gonna look at this different ways. First is the head. The head, uh, and on the slide that says unhealthy cycle, if you're doing the fill in the blanks, that unhealthy cycle is wrong belief, leads to wrong choices, which leads to wrong attitudes and wrong behavior. Healthy belief leads to uh, wrong beliefs, lead to wrong choices, which lead to wrong attitudes. And with attitude, just think of a mood, right? And that mood then leads to wrong relationships and wrong behavior. That's a really good point. I'm glad we got that one in because it leads to what's shaping that individual's soul. When we look at point six, the issues of the soul and the driving forces behind how people make responsible decisions. And I call the first one is simply the head, right? And the head is where we're going to see people with anxiety. People are overthinking. Sometimes it's obsessive compulsive disorder. They're going to be asking questions like, why is this happening to me? And sometimes you're going to hear that obsessive thinking, right? That's one of the areas that I want you paying attention to when we're getting a read on looking into that person's eyes, looking at their skin, but being able to see their soul. We're paying attention to the head. We're paying attention to the heart. This is the feelings. And you're listening to their, their emotions. You're listening to uh, not only what they say with their words. Watch this. I want you to listen with your eyes. I want you to pay attention to nonverbal communication because this area of hidden hostility, if you're paying attention to their clothing style, paying attention to how their posture is, are they sitting up straight? Are they slumped over? Paying attention to their facial features. Are they frowning? As you can read those nonverbals, you can read their emotional state. As we pay attention to their affect, as we pay attention to what they're thinking, we're paying attention to the head, the heart, Let's pay attention to their will. This is the resolute part. This is where they get courage. I'll read it from the study guide. Humans have the ability to choose based on free will. Our will is the combination of our thinking, our feeling, and our decision-making ability. And our will is what makes the deciding vote regarding choice. This is the courage level, right? So we have the head, we have the heart, and we have the will. The head, the heart, the will. And when you line these up, if somebody is able to take their anxiety and I'm their mental health professional and I'm calming them down, we can talk through their feelings. Remember, if you talk through it, you can get through it. And then we can talk about how have you faced problems in the past? How have you gotten through difficult times in the past? See, that's building their will. Now, I'll tell you, the clinical research says that willpower is actually a limited commodity. It's sort of a capacity, right? This bottle of water has capacity. I think it's about 16 ounces. Willpower is capacity. And if people just kind of hold on with willpower, even though that's where they get their courage, they can burn through that. And that's why I go to the deepest level, which is character. Paying attention to character, character issues, and character flaws. People with mental illness even though they may be dangerous, I believe they can be treated. Character flaws will be exposed in behavior. Character flaws will be exposed with words. Character flaws will be exposed with feelings and nonverbals. Remember, over 90% of communication is nonverbal. Tone of voice, rate, pitch, volume, how that individual is moving their hands or if they talk with their hands. Being able to pay attention to those nonverbals is helping you to get into the feelings. And when we can line up head and heart and hands, that's the behavior piece. 
this individual can find a way out of their stress, out of their darkness, and I believe out of dangerous behavior. Thanks, Aaron. The next principle, number seven, is about security. Dr. Stephen Covey in a book called The Seven Habits said, as long as you think the problem is out there, that very thought is the problem. When I look at the issue of security, and uh, this is where I, I share in the research, uh, John Gottman's pioneering research about the ratio of five to one. I believe that our patients and our clients are very stressed, maybe more stressed than they've ever been. And they need courage. They need encouragement. They need hope. You may have heard the term that hope is a strategy, and I don't believe that. I believe that hope is very powerful. I'm a person of faith, and there's actually a verse in the Bible that says, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest emotion is love. But it also lists faith and hope. Hope is very powerful. And when I look at what Dr. Gottman said, and now this was listed, by the way, in a book uh, that uh, uh, was called The Bucket Book www.bucketbook.com, www.bucketbook.com. As a speaker, I, I reference this a lot because it has over 100 illustrations, and it's mostly just research-based stories that are very helpful for clinicians or for uh, business leaders. Uh, the book is called How Full Is Your Bucket, written by Don Clifton, one of the individuals who founded the Gallup Research Group up at Princeton. But listen to some of the research. The number one reason people leave their jobs is they're discouraged and they don't feel appreciated. Bad bosses increase the risk of stroke by 33%. Nine out of 10 people say that they are more productive when they're around positive people. When I take a look at this, we experience approximately 20,000 individual moments in a day. Now that's not minutes, <sighs> that's an experience. For most of us, we don't even pay attention to those, but when you and I can help our clients with mindfulness, when we can help our clients who are feeling stressed, overwhelmed, pressured, maybe they are losing a house. That's really sad. But when you look at people that have lost houses that have gone on to achieve greater things, Walt Disney went through bankruptcy multiple times. When you look at people that lost houses and they accomplished notable things, the tough times didn't crush them didn't make them self-destructive. The tough times made them more resilient. Tough times made them better. I love to read and, and especially to read about resiliency, people facing difficult times. Teddy Roosevelt was one of those people. He'd grown up a very sickly child. His dad was his hero, but his dad died of a heart attack when Teddy Roosevelt had barely gotten out of college. Two years later, his wife was pregnant and she died after the birth of their first baby, and their only baby, she died uh, as a complication of childbirth. Four hours later, Teddy Roosevelt's mother died. His mother, <coughs> excuse me, his mother, his wife died on the same day. Get this, it was Valentine's Day. Wow. For several years, he lived out west because he'd lost his wife, He'd lost his mother, his dad had died, and he loved them all dearly. He let his sister take care of his daughter, and he just went out west, what you and I might call respite. He lived in just quietness in the badlands of Wyoming. But out in nature, he also came back to the idea, what would my dad want? What would my mom want? What would my wife want? They would want me to go on. Instead of self-destructive, he self-developed, he improved, and Teddy Roosevelt became one of the most respected presidents in the history of the United States. How did that happen? He grew on the inside. The tough times grew something on the inside. And that's what I want us to do as our clients are facing these difficult times, these stressful times, these challenging times. I want us to give them hope, courage, resiliency, strength, the more we're able to do that and to show them a way out, the less they have to stuff it inside. We say, Dwight, how do I do all of that? Listen to this. This is again from How Full Is Your Bucket? Uh, and they quote Harvard Medical, uh, John Hopkins. They quote a number of different research institutions. I'm going to stop for a second. <clears throat> <clears throat> Harvard, John Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, 
they quote some of the most respected places in the United States that deal with clinical research on human behavior. And what they found is that the ratio, if you get a negative interaction, you failed, you lost the house. If you have 13 positive interactions, it will balance out. You say, Dwight, you're making that up. Look it up, www.bucketbook.com. And the idea behind it is simple. People have a container and it contains their sense of self-worth and value. If you take and you poke holes in it, it leaks out. But when you and I, as mental health professionals, are able to help fix that, and we're able to say, you can get through this. You know what? Millions of people have gone through divorce and they rebuilt their lives. You can do that too. You know what? Millions of people have lost jobs and they rebuilt their lives. You can do that too. The more you and I are able to be communicators and to guide the process forward, we're giving hope, we're giving strength, and we're protecting that person because, uh, and I love this, again, look it up at www.bucketbook.com because the research shows that if you have positive emotions, once you can get to resiliency, post-traumatic growth, the exciting news to me, you could expand your lifespan by 10 years. Isn't that incredible? 10 years. But what happens if you don't do that? What happens if somebody grew up traumatized? Where does their security come from? If they've lost their job, if their family, or maybe their family of origin tell them they're worthless, or maybe some painful events have happened, Instead of self-developing through the difficult times, instead of building resiliency through the difficult times, they get self-destructive. In your study guide, you'll see this one. This was in the Associated Press. Ronald Schambacher's fiance had made arrangements to go on a Caribbean cruise with her girlfriends before they got engaged. But his father died right before the cruise. Uh, he was sick before the cruise and his fiance declined to return early from the cruise to be with him as he was dying. In his grief, he resolved in his rage to make her suffer the way he had suffered while she was on the cruise and his dad was dying. Get this. He waited until they were married and their son Tyler was seven months old. After his wife was fully bonded with Tyler, that's when he killed their child. You say, that's bizarre. Well, it was given 49 years in prison and it is bizarre. But if we can learn to, I'll pick up my glasses, if we can learn to know how to see, if we can learn how to look, you'll never pick up on what you're not trained to see. So let's talk about some warning signs. The warning signs, and remember, uh, with these warning signs, I think it's on the next slide, uh, Aaron. Oh, not, okay, then I'll just read it. Uh, here are the warning signs for filicide. Evaluating. Parenting capacity with the client asking about abuse in their childhood, right? There's a warning sign. Assessing the parents for potential harm to their children or their stepchildren, warning sign. Mental health screening for suicidal ideation, suicidal risk is a given. But remember, they're going to commit suicide. They're suicidal and filicide. They'll kill themselves almost always. They'll eliminate their own life. However, these are different. It's not just suicide. It's homicide and then filicide. They're killing their entire family. More like the uh, officer in Hillsborough County in Florida who killed his wife, his daughter, and his baby granddaughter. And he did it in front of seven of his coworkers. He called them and said, I'm suicidal. I'm at the school uh, where he was a resource officer and killed himself in front of them. No one had picked up on uh, what today we would simply call post-traumatic stress disorder. He'd internalized all of this pressure through all of those years. And sadly, all of that pressure led to not just self-destructive, but he killed everyone in his family. He said, can you pick up on those things? Here's some clues. Here's another clue. Mental health screening for depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, screening for women with mental illness. And here's the big warning, especially during postpartum depression. For some women during pregnancy, almost always postpartum depression. High, high risk time for the life of the baby and the life of the mom. Having open conversations with the parent about thoughts of harm to children. This baby cries all the time. I just don't know what I'm going to do. 
you say, okay, take a breath, help me understand one of my favorite questions, help me understand, because I want that parent unpacking, I want that patient unpacking what is going on. Being able to uh, ruling out obsessive compulsive disorder spectrum as the source of their obsessive thoughts, because for some people they just have the thought, I've got to kill my child. Remember, the more of these factors, the greater the risk to the child or to the domestic partner. Uh, asking about details in bitter custody disputes or complex divorces that involve children, particularly if the children are going back and forth and there's such a high level of, of conflict, sometimes that's when uh, a mom will say, well, it's easier for me to kill the children than for the children to be around that crazy woman that he's now dating or married to. Uh, postpartum, by the way, I want to mention, goes up to 24 months after delivery. That's when psychosis after the uh, delivery is the greatest. Leaving children unattended, unsupervised, showing lack of attention, being irresponsible with children, not cooking, cleaning, providing for children. Uh, sometimes if an individual in domestic violence is acting more like a zombie and they've lost, uh, they're starting to lose touch with reality, there's a warning sign. Being able to pay attention to parents who fantasize about being single, having their children, missing their freedom, wishing that they could go be with someone that they found on social media or a dating website, but I've got to kill my child so that I can go be with the love of my life. I've given you in your study guide a number of different reference points in the clinical reference, but there's a, a children's song, or it's actually a nursery rhyme, and it's disturbing. When I was growing up, Lizzie Borden took an ax, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her mother 41. Children would sing that as they were jumping rope, I guess because they had a sing song, but it's because it was based on a true story. A woman named Lizzie Borden was never, she went to trial for it in Massachusetts, but she was not found guilty of killing her parents. When you say, is this problem new? No, but it gets a lot more attention. The part that's new is that the frequency is increasing. And so I've given you all of this resource, all these pieces of information. And Aaron, I think we have um, a couple of minutes. I wanna check the text box to be able to see if there are, yeah, there's the, the handout, that's important. And as I take a look at this in the chat box, if you have a question, now would be a great time to uh, ask your question. Yes, folks, please feel free to type in a question if you have one. And as Dwight just mentioned, we do have the handout now load it up in your go to web on our control panel so if you click on the triangle symbol on the left side of handouts you should be able to access that pdf now um, i'll also while we're waiting to see if there are any questions coming in give you a little bit of a heads up about um, a couple upcoming trainings with mbfe that you probably will not want to miss we have uh, two webinars coming up one is coming up in just two weeks it's entitled introduction to comprehensive psychosexual evaluations it's on Friday, July 26th, and it's with Dr. Tommy Black, who is also a uh, certified forensic mental health evaluator who um, is the instructor for our forensic testing workshop. And he is an expert in the area of psychosexual evaluations. It's a two hour webinar, um, so you won't wanna miss that. And it's from one to 3 p.m. Eastern time. And then we have another webinar that's coming up a month from then on Friday, August 23rd. This one we created because of popular demand from you all. Um, we kept getting requests for training on immigration evaluations. So we created a webinar which will have a forensic, two forensic evaluators who specialize in immigration evaluation. And one of them is also an attorney. So she will also be providing information on the attorney's perspective on what uh, attorneys are looking for in those evaluations. We'll cover the eight different types of immigration evaluations and some unique considerations for doing those kinds of evaluations. So that will be on Friday, August 23rd. And for more information on those two webinars or any of our other trainings, feel free to visit us at nbfe.net and then just click on training. Uh, I want you to know, Aaron, there's three times more information with the clinical reference points and the clinical uh, research in the study guide. I want you to take the study guide, share it with people in your office. Uh, there's way more here than there are on the slides. And I think some people may be interested. I put cases of filicide, the case studies, case after case, there's uh, one, almost, uh, almost three pages 
of case studies with the name, uh, the age, how many children were killed, uh, the uh, location, the city, because this way, if you're teaching this or you're sharing this with people, you're able to say, wow, this happened in New Jersey, that's where we're at. Well, this happened in Texas, that's where I'm at. And so this has far more information than we covered on the slides. This is actually the uh, part of the training that I use for a full day on filicide for law enforcement. So this is the, the PDF that Aaron talked about. That's what you need. And the slides uh, are just to illustrate this. This is the takeaway that I wanted you to have so you can go and share it with everyone at your office. All right. Well, at this time, I do not see any other questions. Um, so I believe we'll go ahead and wrap things up for today. We want to thank you very much, uh, Dwight, for your expertise and for your time and giving us this uh, valuable information. And we're getting some thank you comments coming in. Uh, we want to wish you all a happy and fulfilling weekend. And uh, Dwight, are you going to be presenting at the uh, FOMCA annual conference in February by any chance? I will be at the FOMCA conference, uh, the annual conference in February. Thank you for, for asking, Aaron. Uh, that'll be in Lake Mary, Florida. And I'll be doing a two-day certification on complex grief and trauma. Complex grief and complex PTSD will be added to the next edition of the DSM because complex grief, I did not understand until several years ago in Baltimore. I went to the, to the uh, two-day training and I was just overwhelmed. In fact, I made some powerful changes in my life. I didn't understand how complex grief affected me personally as a clinician. And uh, I was able to, after that training, because I'd always struggled with weight, I lost 50 pounds. I'd always struggled with some codependent relationships and saying no. And I was able to set boundaries instantly and, and easily. For me personally, understanding and solving complex grief and complex PTSD has been the most powerful thing I've done personally as a clinician. And I go to continuing education every six weeks and a half for over 35 years. I'll be teaching that two-day training, Lake Mary, Florida, February 2020. 20. It changed me more than any course I've ever been to. I want to give you that same freedom so that you can share it with your clients and your patients and help them pass complex grief and trauma. So for information on that training, you can go to FOMCA.org, which is F-M-H-C-A.org for Florida Mental Health Counselors Association. Um, all right. We will wish everyone a happy and fulfilling weekend, and we will see you next time.